At the time of writing, Frostpunk 2 has just come out, which I've been pretty eager to play for a while. After all, Frostpunk is what really got me into the survival city builder genre as a whole, but one of my most favorite aspects of these games is the sorts of moral choices and quandaries that the player is presented with, and how the game handles and responds to those choices. The way that games handle moral choices has always been an interesting conundrum to me. After all, games in general are unique as a medium and an art form because they are defined by their interactivity. A movie can present a character within the film with a difficult moral choice, but only a game can make the player themselves have to wrestle with that decision. But gaming also has a long history of trying to implement moral choices to varying degrees of success, to say the least, so I thought that it might be fun to look back at some examples of how moral choices have been handled in the past so that I can better learn and explain why I think Frostpunk in particular handles moral choices a lot better than many games have previously. I think that a good place to start with our analysis is of course a very classic example of a simple moral choice, with that being the original Bioshock. Now, Bioshock is a fairly linear game in terms of storytelling. The player doesn't have a lot that they can do to change the course of the plot, but you are presented with one distinct moral choice throughout the narrative, whether you save each little sister or kill them. Now, for some context, the little sisters are essentially kidnapped little girls that have been genetically altered and conditioned to help harvest resources that power the weird superpowers that exist within and also destroyed the setting of the game. And this moral choice is a lot of things about how it's designed and presented that, well, to be frank, I personally don't like, so let's break it down. For one, this is a fairly straightforward binary choice. You can kill the girls to put them out of their misery, or you can help undo some of the damage Rapture has done to them to give them a second chance at living a normal life someday. It's not exactly difficult to figure out which one is supposed to be the quote-unquote good choice. There's a mild attempt at a counter-argument, as Atlas points out, the consequences of your choices are that if you harvest and kill the little sisters, you will get more Adam, which fuels your superpowers, whereas saving them will result in getting less Adam leaving you weaker and making it harder to survive against the other threats in Rapture. Now, it's still pretty obvious that harvesting the little sisters is a very selfish, so this argument doesn't really appeal to morality very well, but I guess this at least does make it somewhat of a meaningful choice. After all, if you die because you didn't have enough Adam to survive, well then you can't save any more little sisters, so there's at least some level of an argument to be made there. But rather infamously, as I'm sure many of you already know, the game kind of bungles whatever narrative weight this choice could have had by giving the player bonus rewards for every three little sisters you save. Essentially, another one of the game's characters rewards the player by giving them some more atom and various health and ammo items, along with unique tonics and plasmids and such that you can only get through saving the little sisters. Sure, it's not quite enough to make up the difference, and you do have to wait a little bit to get your reward, but the total amount of Adam you get for killing three little sisters is 480, whereas the total you get from saving them is 440, so you're only losing out on about 10% of the potential Adam that you could have gotten via killing them, except you also get all of these other goodies I mentioned with the health and ammo and whatnot, which you get none of by killing the little sisters. Now, I kind of get why some people on the design team pushed for this decision. They wanted to incentivize players to actually make the right choice, and they likely didn't want to come off as explicitly rewarding people for making an evil choice, but in doing so, they've effectively robbed the choice of all nuance that it could have had. In my opinion, making the right choice in this kind of setting should generally come at a heavier cost than the immoral one. After all, real life people don't just do bad things because they're evil, they do them because they have a reason for it. If you get more out of being good, then obviously everyone would just pick the good option every time. Nobody would rob a bank if the possible payout from doing so was less than just working a normal 9 to 5 job. The choice is basically the equivalent of saying like, hey, I will give you $9 and a back rub if you give that baby candy, but I'll give you $10 but no back rub if you punch them in the face instead. So like, basically the main takeaway here is I think that the consequences for your moral choices should make sense for the kinds of choices that they are. There should be actual reasons to take either choice, and if one choice is just objectively better in almost every single way, then what is even the point of having a choice in the first place? And on a similar note, I feel like so many games have just blatantly evil options just for the sake of having evil options. In my opinion, the point of these sorts of choices should be that they are an actual question of morality. 
and choosing between saving an orphanage and going on a mass murder spree isn't really an actual ethical dilemma. It's just pointlessly adding blatantly evil options that nobody is really going to pick in good faith because they think that it's actually the right thing to do. So on that note, the next game that I'd like to bring up is Fallout 3. So, if you haven't played Fallout 3, the game presents the player with a pretty big choice fairly early in the game. The first city that you can find outside of your starting vault is this little town called Megaton. Now, Megaton is a pretty wild city because it's built in the crater of a bomb that landed during the Great War, but never actually exploded. So, like, for one, why the hell did they do that? Who in the right mind in a post-nuclear exchange apocalypse goes, you know where it would be a great place to settle? Around one of the very weapons that ended the world. But Bethesda's writing issues aside, naturally this leads to an obvious moral quandary. Do you ensure the bomb is properly disarmed, thus ensuring the safety of the residents of this town? Or do you purposefully detonate it and thus kill everyone for no reason? Sorry, did I say naturally? I meant to say, why the hell is this even a choice in the first place? Like, seriously, this might be the most pointlessly evil choice I've ever seen. You literally wipe an entire town off the map, which means you kill all the NPCs that you could have fun interacting with there and end a ton of different quest lines. Like, you're literally just locking yourself out out of a ton of content right at the start of the game. And what do you get as a reward for partaking in a mini genocide? About a thousand bucks in a hotel room, and that's pretty much it. Like, I guess it's a pretty nice looking hotel room, but you also get paid for disarming the bomb, and you can get a player house in Megaton that you can lock yourself out of by nuking it. And it's not that hard to get your, your hands on some extra cash. Like, not to mention, it's not like the people are Megaton are portrayed as evil or anything. There's some weirdos for sure, but nothing worth exterminating all of them over. It's not like it's a raider town or anything like that. So yeah, it's like, this is very clearly just a matter of the player being given an an evil option just for the sake of having it rather than actually offering any meaningful moral quandary. They just want to give the player the ability to be as pointlessly evil as possible. But this isn't the only issue I have with how Fallout 3 handles morality. There's also the game's karma system, which I think can highlight issues when the developers don't take into account certain actions, or when the karma system just in general doesn't really make sense within the logic of the game's world. So, the game's karma system is fairly straightforward. If you do good things, you get positive karma and people are nicer to you. You do bad things, you get negative karma and yada yada yada. At least that's how it's supposed to work on paper. But this absolute take on morality has a few inevitable loopholes that a lot of people can easily exploit. For example, killing a good aligned character nets you negative karma, of course. But if you shoot a good aligned character, that doesn't actually incur any penalty until you finish the job. But it does make them hostile to you, which means your companions start attacking them too. And if your companions kill them for you, well, you didn't kill that NPC, thus you get zero negative karma. Another good one is how the game handles stealing items. If you open up an owned container and steal stuff from it, you get a small amount of negative karma. That makes sense, but let's say there, there are multiple items that you can steal. If you open the container once and steal all of the items at the same time, you still get the same negative 5 karma. But if you instead open the container, steal one item, but then decide later that you want to steal something else and go back to that same container and then steal something else, you get penalized again for stealing from the same container. So you could, for example, steal three items at once for negative five karma or steal two items separately from the same person and end up earning negative 10 karma even though you technically stole less things from them than the first example and if that's not enough you can put the item you stole back into the container and then steal it again and get another karma penalty for doing so like it's just complete nonsense not to mention that like there i think there's a talent in the game that just sets your karma to the maximum amount instantly so you can detonate a nuke enslave people and just go on a massive murder spree but you took a nebulously defined perk when you leveled up somehow and now you're the paragon of goodness like what kind of sense does that make this just shows in my opinion why this kind of broad systemic approach to moral choices and trying to chart everything on this one absolute scale doesn't really work very well unless you put in a ton of effort to make sure that these kinds of weird edge cases don't exist because players will inevitably run into them if not exploit them. 
On one hand, again, I think I get what they're trying to do here. They want your choices to have consequences, but when you're implementing those consequences, they need to make sense for the actions the player has taken. Why should stealing a random item in a town 10 miles away from my current location affect the attitude of NPCs in a totally different part of the map, especially if I never got caught in the first place? It just doesn't make any sense. There needs to be a logical follow-through between a given action and its consequences. Which brings me to the last game that I want to talk about, which has this and a number of other problems. The Mass Effect Trilogy. Mass Effect might just be the most well-known game that is focused around its morality system, but honestly, looking back on it, I cannot help but feel that there are a lot of flaws in how it handled its moral choices. For one, like I just implied, there are instances where you are locked out of choices across the games unless you have earned enough arbitrary Paragon or Renegade points. It's not a matter of having to do specific things to unlock these choices, you just need enough good boy points or bad boy points, or you can't pick them. Which again, just feels completely arbitrary to me. Whether I say save or kill some random NPC on a distant planet in the galaxy shouldn't affect my ability to make choices in another part of the game unless it directly relates to that planet and that NPC. But that also leads to the other problem that Mass Effect has. By giving these kinds of choices rewards or options that you can only obtain by going pure Paragon or pure Renegade, that kind of removes all nuance from every choice in the game. Now instead of looking at the, every choice for what it is and trying to come up with a moral reasoning for why I want to perform one action over the other, I'm instead directly incentivized to view each action as just a matter of what will give me the most points in the color that I want for that given playthrough. You make one choice at the start of the game between whether you want to do a blue or a red playthrough, and then you just spend the entire rest of the series reiterating that same choice over and over again. Not to mention that this also limits the writing of how each choice can be framed in the narrative. Now, every time the player is presented with an option, it has to fall into this very simplistic paragon and renegade binary and be labeled as such. And real life morality is rarely that simple. I mean, a lot of situations just maybe shouldn't be boiled down to just the good, bad, and neutral choice. But there's also the other big problem that Mass Effect highlighted, which is that most players just want to be a goody two-shoes. We actually learned in 2020 that about 92% of players pretty much only picked Paragon options across the whole Mass Effect trilogy. Sure, technically Renegade wasn't meant to be framed as the quote-unquote evil option, but like, it was colored red, it gave you intimidation buffs, and it often represented the more impulsive, risky, and extra-legal choices that usually ended up putting more people in danger at best, and at worst, there are multiple murderous and genocidal options throughout the games that are labeled as renegade. So it's kind of hard to argue that it's not the quote unquote evil option. So yeah, to reflect on what we've learned so far, it seems that most people generally want to do good things. So when it comes to making good moral choices, there needs to be a real moral incentive to take either choice. And in my opinion, you should avoid labeling things as explicitly good or evil at all costs. And when it comes to creating the consequences for those choices, there should be some kind of logical through line from point A to B. If I steal from someone without getting caught, that NPC should probably not randomly get mad at me for stealing from them. And of course, it'd be nice if these choices weren't always such simple binaries in the first place. So now, this finally brings us back to Frostpunk. So to give some context, Frostpunk takes place in a frozen apocalypse where an endless snowstorm covers the globe. Your goal as the city's leader is to try and guide your population to some sort of sustainable state and generally just not freeze to death. You have to manage things like heating, shelter, food production, and numerous other aspects of life, including how hopeful or discontent your citizens are. Now, you could kind of think of the hope and discontent meters like a morality bar akin to Mass Effect's problematic Paragon and Renegade system, but I think this works a lot better because it's really more of a representation of public opinion than any kind of claim about morality. Is opening a pub a morally good or bad thing to do in the post-apocalypse? I don't know, but I can tell you right now that my citizens are a lot less discontent by having access to booze. And while sure, things like forcing people to work overtime doesn't necessarily have anything to do with my signing a law that allows doctors to perform radical treatments on their patients, it makes sense that they both increase the same discontent meter because all of these policies are affecting the same group of citizens. But I think that a great example that shows how well this game handles morality is to look at one of the first choices that most people make in a playthrough, whether you enact child labor or not. 
Now at first, this seems like a very simple binary choice. Either you make it legal for children to start working jobs despite being underage, or you sign a law that will require you to build care houses and effectively schools for the children to help take care of them while their parents are off working. Not to mention that this seems like a pretty obvious choice in terms of what the quote unquote good and evil options are. But there's a few factors that help make this choice more interesting. For one, you're in a very dire survival situation, especially at the very beginning of the game when you're just finding your footing and you have no infrastructure yet. While it's very easy to say that child labor is wrong from the comfort of a world that is too hot instead of too cold, it's not hard to make an argument that you need all hands on deck if you want to survive. After all, child labor may be bad, but everyone starving to death is even worse, right? Especially since building those care houses will just be another drain on resources when you're already low on infrastructure. So the moral choice here isn't really as black and white as it is in other games. It's definitely not easier to just take the morally good option and walk away with a smug look on your face. But there's also the fact that if you do enact child labor, it doesn't just have some kind of immediate fixed consequence or something like that. Instead, children are literally added to your workforce, and it's up to you how you allocate them to various jobs, just like any other citizen. So if you want to play things safe, you can keep things restricted to just the safest and warmest jobs like working in the cookhouse. Or you can do things like treat the children as an emergency labor force. Maybe you don't put all the children to work right away, but if you're low on a certain resource like wood or food or whatever, you can then have the children help gather that resource for a short time to at least offer offload some labor somewhere else so that the adults can shift their priorities. And then once the crisis is averted, you can take the children off the workforce if you want and they can go back on their merry way with completely danger free. But of course, you can also take things a bit further. If you are really desperate for more hands on deck, you can allow the children to work any job in the colony. And while that is of course profoundly useful for helping the colony as a whole not freeze it to death, but believe it or not, sending the children into the coal mines can indeed have consequences to their health. But again, even that isn't necessarily black and white. Like, if you just send the children into the coal mines for a little bit, you know, as a treat, they probably won't die or get crushed under machinery and whatnot. I mean, when that storm is right around the corner and the pressure is on, you might have to make that kind of tough decision. Because if you don't get enough coal, well, it's game over for everyone. So it's not hard to see a scenario that someone could get themselves into where this feels like a better option than just everyone dying. And like, that's the other aspect of Frostpunk that a lot of the, uh, these other games that I spoke about don't have, which is true risk of failure. Like, for example, say they improved Bioshock by actually making saving the little sisters get you significantly less resources than harvesting them, so that it was actually a proper sacrifice to do so. While that would be better in my opinion, at the same time I think that most players would recognize, at least on a subconscious level, that the game would be balanced around being able to beat it regardless of the choices that you made. Like, maybe it'll be a little harder, but when you die in that game, it's not like your run is ruined forever. You can just respawn and keep trying and trying again from a not too distant save until you succeed. The designers clearly wouldn't want you to start the whole game over because of this choice and its consequences. But in a game like Frostpunk, the failures are often slow and subtle. By the time you realize you've screwed the city over because of your poor decision making, it's often far too late to course correct, and your latest autosave probably doesn't go back nearly far enough for you to fix things in time. So when I talk about this risk of the city dying and everyone starving or freezing to death in Frostpunk and how it can push you to employ desperate and less than ethical measures, this isn't a situation where the city dies just means losing a few minutes of progress as you reload an earlier save. The city could functionally die permanently and the player could lose hours of progress and have to start over unless they take care of whatever the current problem plaguing this colony is. The desperation and push to survive I think gets conveyed well through the game's structure to the player. And like, that's the other thing. I do think this game is actually balanced really well to accommodate most combinations of different laws and policies and whatnot. It's just that, as one would expect, they naturally favor different aspects and play styles. So, to use child labor as an example once again, it's really useful in the early game for getting that extra boost in workforce and helping get things off to a good start. Meanwhile, schooling the kids and letting them become apprentices can really help out research or healthcare in the mid to late game, but that benefit won't be useful 
useful until much later. And I think that this can create an interesting mindset, at least for me. Because, like, for example, early on, when I was worse at the game and just not as good at managing things, I would sometimes have to resort it to child labor in order to help me out in the early game. But as I played more and I got better at managing the city, I no longer needed to rely on that. And I was able to pick laws that I deemed more ethical simply because I was a better leader, even though I was playing through the same scenarios, sometimes even on the harder difficulty. And when I realized that, it made me go, oh, I wasn't resorting to unethical practices because I had a desperate situation thrusted upon me. I was resorting to them because my own poor leadership was what caused those desperate situations in the first place. And I think that that was an interesting and thought-provoking realization to have with this game. So to recap, Frostpunk's take on morality does not constrict itself to any kind of blunt good versus evil dichotomy, and there's a lot of nuance in exactly how you implement a lot of the game's laws that makes the choices more complex than just picking one option over the other. On top of that, the game sets up a scenario where it becomes difficult to always pick the most goody two-shoes options, and it becomes easy, sometimes without even realizing it, to justify various atrocities for the greater good and the survival of your colony. Now, to be fair, Frostpunk does have some laws that are pretty objectively evil, but I think that they still handle these far better than most games do. Unlike choices like how you could just blow up Megaton for basically no reason at the start of the game, Frostpunk's most evil options are actually the last options you can pick at the end of the Law and Order tree. Essentially, when you start to get a good footing on basic survival, you can start to focus on laws that change your colony to be more focused around order or faith. Essentially, do you focus on things like improving efficiency and maintaining the peace, or do you focus on trying to improve people's moods through spirituality and worship? And this isn't a trick question. Once again, the game isn't really presenting either option as the quote-unquote good or evil path. One might initially see faith as maybe the good path because you're focusing on trying to make people happy, but it's also easy to argue that wasting resources on churches and shrines when you're still in a post-apocalyptic survival situation is maybe not the wisest thing to do. And what I like about this is that both options actually get worse and worse the deeper you get into them. At the start, with faith for example, you're doing simple things, like I said, building churches and shrines to help give people hope and motivation, maybe opening up a field kitchen to warm their bellies as much as their hearts. But if you keep going, you start creating things like the faith keepers who go around to ensure that everyone is working and praying properly. You get the ability to publicly denounce the people that you don't like, and you can declare yourself the quote-unquote protector of the truth, and officially be the only person allowed to decide what is considered right and wrong. And that of course leads to every everyone being required to worship you, and anyone who doesn't immediately fall in line with your new religion is deemed a heretic and branded an enemy of your faith. But, of course, things don't get much better on the Order side either. Once again, it starts out innocent enough. You establish morning gatherings to check in with everyone, employ foremen to help improve the efficiency of your buildings, and you can establish a neighborhood watch to make sure that nobody is stealing supplies. But of course, before long, you start building prisons to lock up those that you deem troublemakers, and you can torture them to discourage others from following suit. And of course, you can then print propaganda to justify your actions, and you can probably see where this is going. And my most favorite line in the game is the description of of what effect the final upgrade in either tree has. Quote, hope will no longer be a problem. This is basically the opposite of the problem that I had with Mass Effect's take on morality, where that game practically forces you to go as extreme as possible in one direction or the other. Frostpunk instead presents both options as viable choices, but it asks you how far you're willing to go to survive, with either direction's extremes clearly being pretty bad. But how far you go exactly, where you draw the line for yourself and your people, well, that's up to you to decide. And that is far more interesting as a moral quandary to me than asking me if I want to pick the blue option or the red one. But. As always, I'm happy to continue the conversation in the comments down below. While Frostpunk is my usual go-to when talking about morality in games these days, there are definitely other examples of games that I think handle things just as well as it. Papers, Please is another great one where, sure, it's usually not hard to tell what would be considered the good option in a lot of the game scenarios, but it can be very difficult to take that option when you're worrying about making sure your family is fed for the day and you only have so many minutes to process these people. And Baldur's Gate 3 is, I think, a great example of handling morality systemically 
aesthetically in a bigger, more grandiose RPG. I always felt like the consequences in that game made sense for the actions that I took, and there's just so much variety in the kinds of choices that you can make that there's always going to be a lot more nuance than many other games can handle. A lesser game would make things like telling the goblins the location of the Druid's Grove an automatically evil act, but in Baldur's Gate, you can tell the goblins how to find the Druids after having already set up a massive trap and warning the druids that they're coming so that they walk into their own doom and, you know, things like that. And of course, I'm eager to finally dive into Frostpunk 2 and see how their handling of complex moral issues has evolved into this much more grandiose sequel. So let me know down below what games you like that you think handle moral choices in interesting ways, or even just some examples of other games that maybe don't handle morality very well. And if you liked what you saw, remember to leave me a like, and if you want to see me make more videos like this, then make sure to subscribe and ring the bell. And if you want to really help the channel out, then you can become a member on YouTube, or donate to my Ko-Fi like others have already to help me keep doing what I'm doing. But for now, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next one.